Hey all, Andy here, helping you build a career you love. Welcome to the show. Great to see everybody today. If you're here with me live, get in the chat, say hi. Let me know where you're watching this from. Put some question marks in front of your questions uh, because we are going to be creating a medley of today. We're going to be talking not just about how to build a career you love, but how to get paid what you love because we're going to talk about salary negotiation stuff and it, we're going to create a whole medley of salary negotiation issues. It's going to be made up. Uh, virtually every question is going to be yours. Okay, so let's see. Kara was able to gather some questions as I was going. Anna Yancey, there are some ATS systems that ask you for your salary expectations as required field. How to go about that? Number one, great question. Number two, that's totally true. Number three, I want you to know in concept, in concept, there's not a person that works at any corporation that's going to hold you to what you put in on an application. That whatever's put in on an application, you know very little about the opportunity. You don't even know if you're going to get an interview. Just put something that is close to what you're currently earning. Now, you might have an open field. If it's an open field, which is rare, you can put open or negotiable. If it allows you to put a, and it's an open field that requires a number, you could put $1 or $0 or something like that, and they understand that that means open or negotiable. If it's a drop down, meaning it's, you know, 40,000 to 44,999, 45,000 to 49,999, uh, or whatever it is, and you have to select one. I recommend you just select something near what you're currently earning. Don't you worry. You can negotiate way up. It, it's, it's not, they're not going to hold you to it. The, the one thing that it could potentially do that's most likely is it will, it will screen you out from a system standpoint, which you never want to do. So uh, believe me when I tell you, they're not holding you to that. And then what's going to happen is you're going to get into the interview process. They're going to ask you what your salary expectations are, and you and you can defer then as well, and just say, hey, you know, I just I put that on the application. I didn't know, I didn't really know what that was going to be, and uh, I didn't really know a whole lot about you know everything that goes along with the with the uh, with the position. And so I'm I'm op I'm open. I'm sure we'll be able to come to something amenable. And you can obviously check out my video on what's the best answer to what's your expected salary. All right. And then Kara is telling me the next couple are related to answering what's your expected salary. Okay. So let's see. Jonathan, Ramon, and David Leonard Capelli. All right, so Jonathan's asking me, I've tried not to divulge to recruiters when they ask, what are your salary requirements, but some continue pushing for the number or won't, or won't give up a range when I ask, how do I get past this? This is what I would do, and I'm not being funny, and I'm, I mean, I'm dead serious. Number one, I want you to just let them know, hey, there's a lot that goes into what I consider to be the whole value package, right? There's what I get to do. There's who I get to do it with. Yes, money's important, but it's only one component, right, kind of thing. I'm sure if we're right for each other, we'll be able to come to something amenable. Okay, I want you to give them something similar to my standard answer, and I give you the script and the what's the best answer to what's your expected salary. You can go and scribble it all out. Now, what happens is some of them say, okay, no problem. Some of them say, well, I need a number because I need to make sure you fit in my little box that I have to check, right? And you say, honestly, I'm, I'm really open. I'm sure if we're right for each other. If the recruiter says, no, I really need a number, so you try a second time. The recruiter says, no, I really need a number. Then you say, okay, it sounds like you just want to make sure that I'm, I fit. What's, your, what's the range? If the recruiter says, well, I don't want to tell you that, I probably would say something like, okay, um, well, I mean, is your goal that you want to make sure that I'm okay? If, if it is, why wouldn't you be willing to share? I would probably press them. If now this continues, now, number one, I know this is not a place I want to work. Number two, I would probably give them a range that's incredibly wide, and I would start high and go higher. That's what I would do. But then I would say, 
but I'm really open. You, you asked me to give you a number, but that's my number. I would rather you price yourself out and bug out. But most of the time, if you say, but honestly, I'm really open, and I'd even go lower than that if everything else was in order, you're likely going to be okay, and they'll probably move you forward. Now, these are rare scenarios because in 90% of the case, if you say to the recruiter, hey, why don't you just let me know what the range is, and I'll tell you if that's okay, and then you just say yes and move forward, you're going to be fine. But now if you're getting in rare situations where they're really pressing you and they're unwilling to give you their budget, that's a bad sign, huge red, huge red flag. All right, now, Ramon, what if the recruiter keeps pushing? That's what I would do. And David Leonard Capelli, uh, Capelli, once they continued to ask my salary expectation, but I didn't disclose at the end of the process, I asked what the salary was. I would not do that. Hard no, period, stop. Don't do that because don't ask them what the range is because all that's going to do is throw you off your game. Or if it's a way above what you expect, now you're going to get nervous. If it's way below what you expect, you're going to get you're going to get depressed and it's going to prevent you from performing your best. So I would I would stay away from all of that stuff. If if they're willing to move forward and 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 you can escape without discussing compensation, you're in the best position at that point. All right, that's that that group. Baby girl, recruiter reached out asking if I'm interested in a job description, said need to present rates to their clients, asked what I want to earn and discuss requirements. Please advise how to uh, approach. So in this case, say, I can't give you a rate until I truly understand what's involved. Don't you decide what your rate is based on a job description. You're going from a piece of paper. You know nothing about truly what matters to them. You know nothing about how difficult it's been for them to fill the position, the contract, or the whatever. So I would just respond and say, I'm sh my rates are going to be reasonable based on whatever it is that you want me to do. Let's discuss. Give me more information about what the rate is, or sorry, what the job entails. I have some questions regarding the situation. Get more information before you ever divulge anything. So that's that's how I would handle that. And then Anna Yancey, let's say, let's what what you got here? Looking for ideas on how to best approach the situation when the salary I am currently making is above the average they are willing to pay. Looking for a job in Europe. Okay, so when you are, uh, it, so this makes no difference. Let's just genericize this. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Let's just genericize this. I, I earn this, and I'm guessing the salary ranges are here. The salary ranges are lower than what you are earning or what you expect to earn or the, they're lower than the increase you want. It's just they're lower, period. It makes no difference. Now, if you get into an interviewing process and you genuinely, genuinely like the company, like the opportunity, like everything about it, and the only issue is the money, meaning I love everything, it's my dream job, but I can't, I can't take it for that. When you get into an interviewing process, there are always two or three things that are present that are that are actually malleable. Number one, when you get into an interviewing process, the employer, much of the time, not always, has put together a job description in their mind, and the job description represents the person in their mind that they think is the one who can effectively solve the second thing, the problem, the challenge, the aspiration that they're trying to achieve. So you've got the problem itself and then the person who's going to solve it. And then what they do is based on the person that's going to solve it, they equate a rate, a salary or a level of compensation to what that they think that person is worth. Now, there can be a disconnect between their interpretation of the value that that person's going to provide. And some companies will value certain positions more than other companies will value certain positions. Like some company might just need somebody to create some social media messages. Well, for one company, that, that same job description might be worth 10000 a month. And for another company, it might only be worth 5000 a month. That has nothing to do with you. Okay, 
So now when you get into an interview process, you don't know any of that. You, those three things I just said, you don't know any of that. And so this is why when they say, what's your salary expectation, your response should be, I, you know, I need to see what's what. I need to know what you want, need me to do. I need to, right? I need to understand everything else about what I'm getting and I need to know what you need me to do for you kind of thing. All right, now, when you recognize that, that's your cue to, hey, Annie Yancey, get into the process. Figure out their problem, their goals, their challenge. Now, one other thing is they are assuming that you or whoever was on paper would solve their problem to the degree they anticipated their problem could be solved. Let me be really clear here. I'm going to pay $10,000 a month for somebody to come and write my social media text. And I think for that $10,000, they're going to do a great job and that's going to get me 10,000 new prospects, leads, subscribers, per buyers a month, right? They equate to what the value is for the $10,000. Now, you could get into the interviewing process and change what? The value to which the problem can be solved, overcome, or achieved. Andy, it's not 10,000 people. I can get you 100,000 people. What did you just do? You completely shifted my thinking of the value of this position. What should follow with my thinking in terms of value should be what? The amount I'm willing to pay for 100000 versus the ten. Okay, so you just shifted my thinking from the degree to which I thought the problem can be solved. The other thing that you can shift is the profile of the individual to whom I thought could solve it. Okay, so I was just expecting somebody would say three years of social media experience who basically did it for anybody to be able to come in. You're like, no, Andy, I've seen these different industries. I've worked with other influencers. I'm, I'm the person who knows exactly what you need to do, have done it before, and so on and so forth. And now all of a sudden, the profile I was hoping for has just grown into what? You which is because once I see you, I can't unsee you. Now, all of a sudden, my profile and desire has gone from this to this. So what's ultimately happening is you have an entire recruitment process to change my mind and my thinking in terms of who can do what I want them to do and the degree to which they can do it. By doing that, you've changed the targeted salary range that I had in my mind to... If I get more, I'm willing to pay more, right? Or I'm willing to tie commissions to if you can actually get me 90000 more a month than I anticipated, I'll give you more money. You'll get more bonuses. You'll get more something, more salary, more whatever, right? Kind of thing. So you're asking me a question about what should I do if the, if the salary is too low. I don't even think about the salary, I think about what is it that I want to happen? How do I make that happen? What do I need to do in the interviewing process to make that happen? If we get anchored on, well, the salary started here. I'm in a hole. This is going to be really hard to dig myself. You know what? Everything in your life vies for resources up here. Choose wisely where you're going to spend those resources. I only spend time thinking about what is it that I want to happen and how is it I can make that happen. So that's what I would do. That's a great question. And I probably answered 10 other questions in that one question. But that's what I want you to think when you get into an interviewing process. I need to change the way they think about how the problem can be solved, who can solve that problem, or the fact that maybe they thought, all right, I can only solve the problem to a certain degree, but I'm the best fit because I have the exact experience Andy needs. I have the exact experience doing social media for influencers or people in the expert space or whatever it is. So that's, that's how I would think about that. That's a really great question. Monique, I have 10 years of experience in my field yet the salary I am being offered is less than someone in fast food, how do I convey to the recruiter that I can add value and my experience is worth more? Okay, I love this question. I don't love your situation, obviously, but here's what I say. Let's just forget, let's detach ourselves for a second, okay? I... Let's 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 go let's go another way. Monique, let's take you out of the equation for just a second for illustrative purposes. Monique, I'm Andy. I have 34 years of professional experience. I have seen it all. 
You'll never be able to find somebody who has more knowledge than I do. You'll never buy a program from somebody who's willing to spend more time with you and be there whenever you need it. And you'll learn the most advanced tactics and I'll, I give you online support and group coaching and so on and so forth and on and on and on for days. And then you get somebody else who may be prettier than I am, maybe whose website is cleaner, who I don't know, a whole bunch of other stuff. And they have three years of experience, right? I'm, I've had more years of experience they've been alive on this earth. Now, if you say to me, well, Andy, I can't pay $9.97 for your program. My reaction would be, well, but I give you 34 years of experience and it's all well packaged and I, there's nobody out there that you can find that'll have more experience than I do that will package it this effectively. Think about it. Is it that you don't value my 34 years of experience or you just don't want value it at 997? You follow me? So it isn't about your 10 years of experience. It could be, I only think that it's worth paying $97 for job search coaching, right? It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with how you value what you think your investment is worth. So whoever you're interviewing with, that employer is not necessarily looking at your 10 years of experience while I want you to try to show them the value that your 10 years will give them, right? But they just might be thinking, no, it's only worth $5,000 a month. So one of the techniques I've given you in a video about what to do when you get a low ball salary offer is you should ask the question, hey, Mr. Recruiter, is that what you are willing to pay anybody for the position? Or is that what you think I'm worth? Meaning, it, I would say to you, Monique, 34 years of experience, do you think I'm worth that or I'm only worth that with everything I've shown you and everything I've done? And if you say, hey, that's just what I'm willing to pay, then you think that's it, Max, everybody's worth that. And then you're just looking for your right fit. So the recruiter is saying, or the company is saying, we don't care. We only value it at $5,000 a month. I don't care if she's got 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or whatever. I don't really care. I only value that function at a certain rate. Okay, so you have to determine, is the employer open to being convinced based on years of experience, value, and what you're going to contribute? So that's how you need to look at things. A lot of times it isn't even about you and then you take it personally when it has everything to do with the employer's view and interpretation of what that position is worth. So I hope that helped. The girl genius. What if a job has a salary range posted in the application but you want to negotiate for more than what was advertised for the job? This is not a what if, this is a it always should be. Meaning, I always want you to negotiate for more than whatever the publicized range is. And the only way for you to be able to do that is to show your value along the way, make sure that you show them how you're going to help them transform in the future, right? Meaning, when you hire me, this is what's going to happen to you. It isn't, you should pay me because I know how to do this. Everybody I'm interviewing knows how to do this, okay? So that doesn't separate you from anybody else, and it certainly doesn't separate you from the publicized range that I've posted. It's how much more are you going to help me solve my problem? How much more value are you going to give me? And in a, in a discussion that I had with you uh, a couple of weeks ago, it might have been last week or the week before, one of the things that you want to do whenever you are negotiating your counter offer to which is ultimately what I think your question is you want to show someone here's what you want me to accomplish here's the objective and what we're going to do here's the challenges it's going to take to overcome here's what I'm going to do here's what's going to happen to you as a result of what I'm going to do here's how much that's worth meaning you can either tangibly say Andy it's not going to be 10,000 leads a month. It's 100,000 leads a month. And if I give you 100,000 leads a month, Andy, can you tell me how many, whenever you have a lead, what percentage of your leads 
buy something from you and what the average lifetime value of a customer is. Give me those two numbers and I'll tell you what it's going to, that's 90,000 extra is going to be worth to you. Or Andy, what could it mean if I get you 100,000 a month, right? That's showing me value and, and, and making sure that you're explaining what that value is going to be because what you want to do is take, take these, right? My eyes off your cost and move it to what? Your value. So let me give it, let me give you an example. If I said to you, my boot camp costs a thousand bucks, what do you think? <gasps> Andy, I'm unemployed. I can't spend a thousand dollars. I won't be able to eat next week, right? That's what you think, right? That's what goes through your head. Why? Because you swipe the card and then you pay the thousand bucks, right? But what if I said, do you know that hmm, if you make 25 bucks an hour, that's 50 grand a year. That's what, $100 on Monday morning? It's $100 on Monday afternoon? And between Monday and Friday, you make 1000 bucks. How many weeks of work have you been out? Been out three months? Right? Thousand, 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 thousand. Right? Okay, well, I can, I'm guessing I can help you find your job five days faster than you can on your own. You and me together versus you by yourself. Right? Kind of thing. And then... And then not only are you going to find it faster, but you're going to get paid a lot more because you're going to interview better and you're going to know how to put the counter offers together and you're going to know how to negotiate. And you're going to know how to do this and that, right? So I just met with a guy last week. I talked with you about him last Thursday and he just got a, you know, earning say 72 grand, got a double pay to move, right? How much value is that? Was it worth his 800 bucks or whatever to get a 60 some odd thousand dollar pay increase? Yeah, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to move the employer's attention off your salary because your salary in isolation might sound expensive to them. $100,000, $50,000, right? Except Andy, you're going to make millions more. Don't you think 200,000 for me sounds pretty like a pretty good deal? when you're gonna make two million more for the work I do, right, kind of thing. You wanna sell your value. And so that's how you get to, that's how you would negotiate effectively to do that. It's called framing, right? Get, make me see things the way you want me to see them. Okay, I hope I got that. That was, that was the girl genius. And Pratik, Pratiksha, wait. Pratiksha, uh, I have upgraded my skills. There is a gap in my full-time job. Recruiters are negotiating a lot lower salary. What should I do since I have been underpaid? So, so first thing, first thing, when you negotiate, you negotiate forward. What you've earned up until that point only matters to you in terms of what? How much do I need to live, right? That kind of stuff. It has nothing to do with what you should be paid going forward. Now, if you've upgraded your skills, you said there was a gap in your full-time employment. I'm wondering if you mean during your gap, which you currently have, you have spent time upgrading your skills, probably getting educated. If that's the case, that's wonderful, and that in and of itself might serve as an elevator into your ability to get hired. However, I wouldn't necessarily, meaning me as a hirer, wouldn't give you more money for being educated. I would give you more money if you had practical experience and were able to show me, based on that practical working experience, how you're going to transform our lives as a company, right, kind of thing. So I would go back to some of the previous... Um, a tactics that I've given to people who want to negotiate for higher pay or negotiate counter offers is it's all about showing your value going forward. Mohit, what's the best way to negotiate if you are coming back from a layoff? Okay, so uh, this is a great question. Your negotiation tactics have absolutely nothing, zero, zero, nothing to do with your current situation. Wait, let me be really clear what I just said. How you negotiate has nothing to do with what you earn, and if you earn zero, it still doesn't matter, okay? 
The only reason you think it matters is because you're dealing with all this internal stuff and nervousness, right? I need to take that job. I make nothing, right? So I need to get money coming in so I could put food on the table. And you feel like your negotiation leverage is dropping because of your own internal noise. It has nothing to do with the way you would negotiate. When I was coming off, a, I took a year off in 2003, the greatest year of my life, <laughs> the year of Andy, right? I golfed, I traveled, I did, 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 did all kinds of stuff. And I was then going to go back to work in the beginning of 2004. So in October or November, I started to lightly look for a job. I had, I was unemployed, right? I literally took a year off. And I saw, and I'm in like 10, 11 months into this. So I started interviewing three job offers. And I said, to each of them, look, hey, this one's giving me the offer, that one's giving me, like, my negotiation leverage doesn't come from anything other than here and here, so all the tactics I've given you regarding, don't give them a number, don't, don't, right, don't take any concessions, go through the process, sell the heck out of yourself, right, get down to the end, and you still negotiate, it is about what you're gonna do for them, it has nothing to do with what you earn or your current situation, whether you're employed or or not employed. All that's a myth, and so you, your, your negotiation leverage is not less. Might an employer try to toss a lower rate at you because you're unemployed and they think you might grab it? It's up to you to say no, right? So, so it isn't about, the, the best way to negotiate anything is, is using the tactics I've given you irrespective of your situation. And so it's up to you to stand fast and hold firm. Karen, when companies hire you, they gain all of your accumulated skills and expertise, so there should be an understanding that vacation time should be commensurate with the level of position, just like salary. Okay, nothing could be further than the truth. Your vacation time is what? Vacation time based in the future, based on what? My corporate policy, how I value vacation time for the employees, has nothing to do with the fact that you're used to earning five weeks, right? So when you're moving to a new company, then it's up for you to decide, okay, if Andy's only gonna give me two weeks, do I want still want the job? Do I wanna try to negotiate for ad additional vacation time? That's entirely up to you. But my interpretation of what I consider to be appropriate vacation has nothing to do with anything that you're used to or how old you are or how many years of experience that you, that you have. Just like how much I pay you should not be based on anything you've been paid previously. It works both ways. So it's a great question, but it's just not true and it's not a fact. And, and you will find that employers just don't care, meaning they do care about you and they want you to be happy if they're going to recruit you. But if you earn five weeks and they have a corporate policy that says everybody starts at you know 12 days, that's that. Now, you could negotiate for more and maybe they'll give you that, but it's, like, it's unlikely that you're going to get the five weeks if they cut it in half to start. And then Louisa, hi, Andy, I just passed an offer. Uh, they said vacation and the salary are non-negotiable. Yes, I, I, I get that. Each company can decide what is negotiable. I will tell you, in general, I want you to go into any process thinking, what, everything's negotiable, right? It is. Everything's negotiable. I've had people negotiate with me in the Mile Walk Academy for me to create packages that didn't even exist, that I created for them because they wanted something. And I said, okay, right? Everything in life is negotiable. But then again, each company gets to decide what's negotiable and what isn't. There may have been problems with people getting upset because there were exceptions to vacation rules and this and that for people that were hired versus people that were there six years who hadn't accumulated four weeks and you just gave it to somebody who hasn't spent one hour working here and it creates turmoil. All that stuff is possible and it's, 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 it is what it is. All right, salary, okay, we got a bucket here. Salary negotiation for contracts. I love it. Steve Green, what's happening, buddy? Uh, oh, don't you love, right when I'm in the middle of reading something and then Kara slacks me and then everything goes zoop, off Andy's page. Uh, when considering contract assignments versus full-time roles, 
how do you approach salary negotiation for contract and contract to hire roles? Okay, here's I'm going to give you the ideal scenario. If you're going to negotiate for a contract, you just negotiate for the contract. You're going to pay me $100 an hour. I'm going to do this. Maybe we agree that we're going to visit this and revisit this in 90 days, 180 days, 270 days, or 365 days, whatever it is, right? And that that's fine. And you negotiate. And how much money you want to make per hour can be dependent on a number of things, and it's more art than science. But remember, rule of thumb, there's about 2,000 working hours in a year. Rough cut, just for fast math. If you make $100 an hour, you make 200 grand a year, except... You're not getting benefits. You might not be getting vacation. You might not be getting other perks, long-term uh, you know, incentive plans or disability or all these other things, okay? So, so you have to keep that in mind when you quote a rate. Then if it's a contract to hire, let's say we negotiate 100 bucks an hour and we decide in, in six months, you want to turn me into an employee, at 100 bucks an hour, I'm roughly making 200 grand. Except you're also not getting all the other things and you're not counting and you're in the US and you're not counting all the additional expenses the employer has to pay in terms of of uh, employer tax, right? There's another 16%. I'm like there's a lot of other taxes they're going to have to pay roll tax and other things that they're going to do. They're also going to start putting in vacation. Every one week of vacation is 2% of salary. So if I give you a week of vacation, that's four grand effectively. Or if you're earning 100000 it's two grand. So you got to understand those kinds of things. Not to mention general paid holidays and other things like that that go along with whatever uh, the employer is going to give you as a perk. Not to mention, there could be 401k matches. There could be just the fact that you have a 401k and are able to siphon off uh, dollars that you don't have to pay taxes on, at least at the moment, and those kinds of things. So you might go from 200000 to the equivalent of 150, except the 150 at 75 an hour, as opposed to the 100 an hour, is an even better deal for you. So... So those are the kind of things. Now, what I tend to do and recommend, and I, I actually coach a lot of people on this who are going through these scenarios where they're on a contract and they're trying to convert and they're, they're going to convert and they're like, Andy, I need help negotiating this. So a lot of times what will happen is we will lay down for them. Um, bit, Steven, you're in the boot camp, so you have the grid and you know what I'm talking about, right? So you got to identify, well, here's what you want me to do, goals and objectives, this and that. Now, if it's a contract to perm and you're staying in the same position, you have a running interview of six months or three months or nine months or whatever it is, that a track record of proving yourself that you're a dang safe bet, right? Kind of thing. Otherwise, they wouldn't be hiring you. And so you're going to lean on that as a throw in of, hey, and I'm a good bet. And you could see obviously how I perform. But I would still be focused in the future, just like I was trying to negotiate a pay raise. But you're also not, it's, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but you would go about it the same way. And I would prefer, the last thing I want to say about this is you do not lock in your salary at the time you start, start a contract, meaning you don't say, I'm starting as a contractor today and then in six months, I'm earning $100 an hour now and in six months, you're going to pay me $150 in salary. Don't do that. Don't do anything until you get right up, right up to the to the negotiation table for when they say we want you to we want you to um, to, to become a full time employee. Because why? Because I want you looking for other opportunities along the way, and I want you to be able to hold those other opportunities right as leverage when you're negotiating your salary going forward with the company who you're going to be converting with. The other thing is you might want to convert sooner than the six months. In three months of the six months, you might get a great job offer that while really good, you would take it, but you'd prefer to work for the company who you're contracting with, right? What? A, how do you know what's going to happen? Then you turn to the company you're going to be contracting or you're contracting with and you say, look, I love you. I want to stay here. These guys gave me a great offer. Can we convert me now? Right kind of thing. I don't want 150. I want 175, right kind of thing. Well, you won't use those words, but you know what I'm saying for purposes of, of illustration. So you want to be careful. Uh, Udomo, Udono, 
Uh, do you have any tips for salary negotiations for somebody transferring from a contingent worker to an employee? There you go. Ian, what's a good way to negotiate a shift? There you go. Kara, do me a favor. Make sure that's grouped time-wise together in your, in, your, uh, in, your, in your little diary there. Thank you. Elliot Axelrod. What's up, buddy? How you been? I interviewed for a sales job with a company. They've come back with a potential for a role that's, a, that's solution creation and management. How do I deal with the salary negotiation? Elliot, you go into your boot camp, module five, you go to the advanced salary negotiation video and you do exactly what's in there. But for those of you that do not have access to this beautiful session of mine, uh, effectively, the short answer is you do not negotiate for anything until you're clear on the solution creation and management roles responsibilities. Here's the areas I'm going to focus on. Here's the objectives in those areas and the goals we're going to attain. Here's the priorities. Here's what I'm going to do to attain them. Here's what you're going to do to help me attain them. Here's what it's going to be worth to you. And this is the tally up of the value I'm going to contribute. Can we agree this is now the role you want me to do? By the way, if I was writing a job description, that's the way I'd write it, okay? Meaning, here's what we need from you. This is what success looks like. Here's what you're going to do. Here's what we're going to contribute. Here's what we're going to enable you to do. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's what we're shooting for. Here's what our expectations are. All that's in the grid, right? So you put that together. Then you say, can we agree on this? Great. Okay. If I make you solutions and I create these that we are going to sell to the tune of X hundreds of thousands per whatever. And we target that in a year when I'm done with all this, you're going to be able to sell this to X number of people. That one solution you created is enabling them to make $12 million. It's not how much time you spent doing that. It's the fact that you are able to create a solution that they now can take and sell for $12 million or 1 million ahead or 50,000 or whatever, right? Kind of thing. You're, right, Those are residual benefits that go on and on and on and on based on something that you did. That's more valuable to me, and I'm not paying you for your time. I'm paying you for your value. That's the biggest problem that a lot of you have is you think you're negotiating for your time. I would never negotiate for my time. When you pay me for a coaching session, it has a cost associated with it that has nothing to do with what I actually think my hour is worth to me. Right, It is a, a discounted rate that I give you because I feel like it's appropriate based on the value I'm going to contribute for you. Right, When you get a salary, that salary should be based on the value that the employer is getting out of you, not the fact that you're punching a clock from 8 to 5. Right, What am I going to do with these outputs? Those outputs are not as powerful, uh, valuable, or going to help me either generate as much money or, or decrease cost to a certain degree they get paid less right so you know it, it when 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 people say to me well i have in demand skills i don't look at skills as in demand per se because yeah i get that employers want this technical skill or that functional skill or whatever but i'm looking for something that is in i think in terms of what's the output you're talking about inputs i'm talking about outputs all the money is attached to the output, not the input. Nobody buys features. Nobody buys a product. People buy transformation. They don't buy Rolexes to tell time, right? It's how they feel. It's what they th the value is going to be when they look at the watch or how much they're going to impress their friends. No one buys the exercise regiment because they want to work out for two hours a day, sleep right, eat right, and do all that other stuff. They buy it because of what they think their body's going to look like right kind of thing that's the output so the value is in the output but don't try to sell your features the feature should be a tag along that's why i always want you discussing things in the future because the future is about their transformation your past is about your features okay lisa williams you are a boot a dear boot camper if i can say so what you say about not negotiating with the one who can say no, but not the one who can say yes. How do you get around this when working with a recruiter who speaks for the company? So, uh, so, so um, in my little talk, one of the things I actually forgot to, to mention 
uh, was that when when I when I try to work my way into a process, right? So meaning I, I mentioned to you how I try to meet the executives and meet the other people, not just deal with the recruiter, right? Get them attached to me and try to impress the right people. When you do when you're when you're up front talking with the recruiter and that's the only person that you know, the reason you want to just get by the recruiter, meaning don't give them a reason to bounce you out, is so you can develop the relationships, so you can investigate the company, see if it's a good one for you, but so that you can also dazzle all these other people. So what I would do with the recruiter who said, no, Andy, I can't go any higher, uh, then when they said no, hard no, and I'd say, okay, then a lot of t then what I would do is I would send an email to the executives and say, oh, hey, so-and-so, um, I wanted to reach back to you. I really enjoyed meeting with you. I really thought we'd hit it off. I thought we were a great match for each other, especially because of my experience as a practitioner and this and that, no, right, and so on and so forth. And uh, but so and so said they were powerless. Sounds like you guys are set for now. If anything changes, let me know in the future. That is what does that sound like? The rejection technique, right? So so in those cases, I'm I'm making a decision with the recruiter who speaks on behalf of the company. It, I'm talking about getting down to the end and you're getting all the way through all the other tactics, but you come to an impasse. And they said, this is it. And if the recruiter is the one saying this is it versus the recruiter saying, no, Lisa, I went to Andy and Andy said, this is it. That's not, that's not the scenario I painted. The scenario I painted is when you hit a hard stop and you need to go above that person's head. And so... Uh, so in those cases, what I would do is I would say, okay, well, I number one, I'd be willing to walk away. And it, when I do walk away, I'm going out with the rejection email so that I would send my version of the rejection email to the executives or to the hiring officials or whoever else I had interacted with. What you could do is you could send that rejection message to the boss or to whomever you could. That's, that's, how, I, that's how I do that. Sometimes you cannot get around that. But there's nothing that's going to stop you from sending a message up the chain, right? That rejection message that I've given you, I've actually written you a whole booklet on the rejection and resuscitation techniques in your program. So, so that's that's how I I think about that, and that's a little kind of tack on to uh, to 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 when that recruiter would say no. Can can an hourly wage be negotiated? Now you got to remember when you're a contractor. Most, much of the time, what happens is if I'm the hiring company and I need certain people, contractors, even if it's just one, but let's say it's multiple, I'm working with a number of staffing firms at the same time and I'm saying, can you get me an accountant? Can you get me 10 accountants? And what happens is I'm going to take the lowest cost ones, right? Because I consider those commoditized. It's, I should be able to find them. I go to firms that have relationships so they can get them to me quickly. And this stuff is over in a matter of hours, not days. Okay. It's kind of like the rec goes out at eight o'clock and then it doesn't, you know, like by noon, who, like I'm going to have 25 resumes kind of thing. So when you start negotiating hourly wages that are outside the boundaries of a contract, uh, basically a contract rate that I would prefer to pay, you need to be pretty exceptional. And it's a rare, it's, it's much, much harder to make an argument about the rarity when you're on a contract like this. Now, now, the other extreme is I'm so awesome that I don't want to be a full-time employee for everybody because I have such a rare skill that I, I contract myself out to the highest bidders and I can make a lot of money and people have to pay that because I'm so uniquely skilled. Or I have such an area of specialty. So you can use the same kind of negotiation tactics, right? You got to show your value and why it's so rare and all that other good stuff. But so you want to be really careful. So when you're working with a recruiter, and I would not even call recruiters who work for staffing firms recruiters, they're more agents than anything. But when you're working with that person and that person says, what is your, what is your uh, rate I'm inclined, if I just need the work, to say, what's the standard rate that they would normally pay to get this, the contractor to do that? And then I would decide if I was okay with that, and then I would say, yes, I'm comfortable with that, or no, I'm not, 
you know, normally I receive whatever, but I wouldn't be so high because they're just going to move on to the next person. And if you're trying to negotiate this as an individual, but not through a staffing firm, then you just need to be careful. And it also is going to depend on your relationship, strength, your relationship with the person you're negotiating with and whether you have a track record with them. So that's what I would say there. And then Steve, I've reached out to smaller companies that I want to help grow and get maximum pay later as they grow. How early should I state this? Never, never. Some seem scared of my broad and extensive experience and pay. So I leave that up to you. If you want to go in and say to them, hey, you know what? I'm open to that level of compensation because I'm really interested in joining you as I prove myself and whatever. You know, we can certainly revisit my my pay as I'm assuming you would. Make sure you're agreeing to that you're going to have some kind of review in a certain amount of time. I would not be saying anything about, you know, maximizing pay later, wanting more of this or that. Because number one, it, you haven't shown them anything. If you are willing to take what it is they're open to offering you, then then why I, I wouldn't I wouldn't muddy any waters with with what might or might not happen. And then what happens if you fall flat on your face? What happens if, or the company, or no fault of your own, but the company goes south? Or maybe the company gets acquired, maybe the company divests, maybe the company goes bankrupt. Who, who knows what's going to happen? I would not. I would be locked and loaded and focused on doing the best job I absolutely can at, 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 at any moment in time, up until it was time for me to say, okay, now you've seen what I can do. Let's talk about what initiatives I'll be taking on going forward and what those are worth to you. That's how, that's how I roll. Gisela, do you have any suggestions on how to negotiate commission percentages and add-ons to the commission like travel expenses and car expenses? Okay, so first thing, first thing is... Uh, travel expenses, car expenses, hotel expenses, lodging, stipends, per diems, cell phone reimbursement, and all of that stuff should be part of a standard package that they give their employees. I realize for you, you're going through and trying to uh, create a compensation package for a position that you're trying to attain for which they did not have a job description and so on and so forth. I'm familiar with you and your situation. Um, from our email exchange. The, the way that I would go about that is I would just, I would like flat ask, like, can you just clarify uh, the expense reimbursements for travel and so on? What's the expense policy? I want to ensure that all that's in order. That's it. That's a standard. That's like ground zero. And then when you talk about the commission percentages, I gave you in that email I sent you how I would think in terms of value. Now, I think you had a spot to start like 6% or something like that. But I think in terms of, and I don't know, you know, kind of what, how much of what you're going to be selling. But for any of you that are trying to figure out what's the appropriate percentage of commission, well, what... Uh, it, 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 you you come at this from a number of angles, and this is this is as much art, if not more art, than it is science. Because when I think about, uh, I negotiated my percentages for a consultancy once, where I looked at what's my target quota. What do you want me to sell? How many millions? For every million, what do I want to take home? Right. If I want to take home fifty grand for every million, which is totally appropriate, and then I say five percent, that's a fine number. Or if they say, "Well, we want to do it based on profit. What's your profit on a million? A hundred thousand? Okay, I get whatever ten percent of the profit, fifty percent of the profit. I get whatever it is, and then I try to look at holistically based on what the expectations are, what I think I can attain, and with 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 um with percentages and commissions, what I really want to do is I want to say, look, you want me to sell as much as possible. You want to pay me as much as possible. You do, because if you're paying me more, I'm, I'm selling more. I would try to say, I would try to set up some kind of accelerator where it's, it's X percent for the first whatever. Then it jumps, then it jumps, then it jumps. And the more I sell, the more you pay me and the higher the rate you pay me because when we get into the championship numbers, I really ought to be raking it in. There's ways of doing it 
that way to incent you to continue to sell. There's, you should never have a cap on your earnings as a salesperson. That would de-incentivize you to, to keep going. And so I look at it from different angles. So how much are they expecting you to sell? And what, what do you want to earn? And can you make an argument that if you sell $3 million, you're worth 200000 at 6% kind of thing or something like that? So that's how I, I would do that. The expenses all should be automatically paid. You should never have to pay for that, ever. So, so keep that in mind. Thomas Ivey, I got an offer from a company that I really liked. Offer salary was over 10K less than advertised. They made up a difference with bonuses. What would you have done? I would have made a count. You, again, you're in the boot camp. I would have made a counter argument just like I outlined for you in the advanced salary negotiation phase. So if they came in and said, all right, you know, it's 10, let, let's, just, let's just say this. Okay, uh, we, they advertised 90 to 100 and they gave you 80. Okay, now, first thing is, first thing is, I, I, I really need you guys this to register. The fact that they put 90 to 100 means nothing. It means nothing. It's, this is what we think it's worth. Now, remember when I said there's multiple things that are present? There's the, the person in mind, the, pro, the degree to which the problem can be solved, and so on. Now, I have no emotional attachment to your offer. Right? I love that you got one, right? I love that. I love your boot camper and all that other stuff. But my point is, could we step back for a second and say, could I say to you, is it possible, Thomas, even though they only offered you 80 that was a raging victory because you're not even somebody that they thought could do the job, but you did such a great job convincing them that you could do the job. So they looked at your lack of experience, maybe some things you didn't do well in the interviewing process. They gave you the offer anyway, and it should be a, we should be doing backflips, right? That is a view. That is a perspective. So without knowing why they gave you 10% or 10K less than was advertised, I don't know. But it might be they loved you so much they were willing to actually give you an offer. Like, that's possible, right? Do you guys understand this? Like, it, so the minute we get, like, the minute somebody attaches a number to us, right? If, if it's less than we thought we should, if there was no, Thomas, if there was no number on that paper and you didn't know it was 90 to 100 and they gave you 80, would you be happy? Is that appropriate for you or 110 or 150, whatever they gave you? So, so first thing is perspective. Second thing is I would still go at it. All right. If, if you feel now 10,000, if it's like they were going to offer you 20,000 and they just gave you 10, that's a huge difference. If it was 190 to 200 and they gave you 180, that's not a big deal, right? It's you're pretty close. So I don't know what range we're talking. That's the first thing. Second thing is, so I don't know that it makes sense that this is a total low ball. Maybe they think, hey, let's stretch it and give it to him, right? Even though he doesn't have everything we're looking for, right? And so without understanding all that, but even so, I would still go at it with, here's what you want me to do. Here's what it looks like. Here's the value I'm going to contribute. If all goes well and I'm able to hit these numbers, can you create a compensation package totaling whatever the number is? and give them a, a pathway into helping you meet whatever the number is that you want. That's what I would do. And I would say, then, then, if it's kind of a hard no, you can say, I'm just curious. This is okay. I'm just curious. I noticed when I started uh, the process and I looked at the advertised salary, um, it was 10, 15K higher, 12K higher, than what you offered me. So it was, it was lower than the lowest number. Is there any reason for that? Right, kind of thing. Well, Thomas, the person that we were expecting to hire had these five things. You only have two of them, but we love you so much that we're giving you this offer, right? So, so, so I would like to understand all of these things before I, before I did anything. But I, I, it's a great, great question. But I hope, I hope that gives you some way of looking at that. All right. Satish, what's up? How are you? Good talking to you the other day. How to determine the target salary to negotiate after the offer? Should it, should it stay within a percentage of offer? No. 
Wait, I'm not even going to be funny here. There is no way to determine the target. Let them pitch you a number. You go from there and make your counteroffer. So, I mean, and, and the other thing too is it isn't about a percentage. So I was working with somebody the other day. Uh, they offered them a number. They gave them a bonus. They had some others and extras and other things. There's a whole bunch, signing bonus and all kind of stuff in there. And we went at all of it. And it wasn't about what the range or the percentage or the whatever was, right? It was, hey, this is what you want me to do. Boom, boom, boom. If all, if all this happens, I'm going to protect us from that. The downside, I'm going to protect us from that. And so on. Here's my counter, right? Can you create a package where? So it isn't, I mean, I work with people where we ask for 10K more because we know certain things. I work with people where we ask for 100K more. I work with somebody we ask for 300K more. And, and so it, it's, 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 there's no set percentage. And there's no formula I could give you that says, oh, if this, then that. Jonathan Thomas, similar. When applying for, do you have a recommended resources as a base? I don't look at anything. I don't look at online stuff. I don't look at surveys anymore. I don't look at Glassdoor. I don't look at the Wall Street Journal who says project managers or engineers make this. All that stuff is nonsense, is nonsense to me. So I would be thinking, what is it that they want? What is it that they're offering? What do I feel comfortable with? How can I make an argument for more and go and go from there? They would, you know, those surveys and, and baseline numbers and market pay, it would be like me saying, you shouldn't buy that stock unless it's trading between this and that. Except, well, why is it trading at twice that number? Why is it trading at half that number? Because on this day, that's what it's worth. Because that's what the investors say it's worth. On that day, how much you're willing to take is entirely up to you. You don't have to leave your job or you don't have to leave your couch. It's what is it going to take? Hey, well, I talked to five of my friends and they all seem to double their pay. Why is that? Oh, because there aren't any of those people with the, that skill. Okay, well, it isn't, it isn't what Glassdoor said or what people were making nine months ago. No, today I have to pay you double to get you into my and to get you into my company. Otherwise, I live without you. Right? That's why it's very difficult, which is why I don't want you agonizing over am I getting paid too much? Am I getting paid too little? Get a number, focus on it, try to get to it, make your best argument about the value you're going to contribute, see what happens, decide if you're comfortable. Let me let me give you an analogy. This is what I think about money. When people say, Wait, by the way, I want you to have more. I want you all to be rich, right? That's why I'm spending all this time giving you all this advice on salary negotiation. When people say to me, well, Andy, it's really important. I said, tell you what. I'll pay you a million dollars a day for the rest of your life, but you can only live to tomorrow. What would you choose? Oh, you want time, not money. I'll give you a million dollars a day, but you're going to be sick the rest of your life. Well, no, Andy, no, I want my health. Oh, you want your health, not money. I'll give you a million dollars a day, but your best friend's got to die. Oh, you mean you want your relationships? I'll give you a million dollars a day, but you never get to go home, right? Like, I, you pick any question you want. You will cho always choose something other than money when it comes to these extremes, right? So what makes you think you're going to be so much happier with a little bit more? right? So just think about that. Just think about that. All right. That's, that should help with the agonies and the anxieties and those. <laughs> I don't know. Evan, great info, Andy. I have an offer called it. Yes. Can we give Evan a high 10? And the position is a career change from scientist to scientific sales. Can my PhD use to negotiate more salary with no sales experience? Absolutely not. I would I would not use that. I love that you're getting an offer. It, your PhD in whatever it is in is in no way going to make me change how much money I would pay you. Selling, selling is about selling. I'm going to pay you in pro rata based on what you sell. 
I'm going to pay you a base or a draw based on how much sales experience you have selling what I need you to sell. But everything else is irrelevant to me when it comes to sales. It's like, it is like you, there is absolutely no correlation. There is absolutely no correlation to how well somebody can be an engineer, a scientist, a bookkeeper, and anything analytical to selling. In fact, I would argue the more you are one, the less you will be the other. So obviously you're doing something right if you're going to be moving into, into sales, but I would, I would think long and hard because it is a completely different animal uh, than, than probably than what you've been doing. But I, I mean, I, obviously you're going to give it a go and I wish you a lot of luck, but just practice, practice, practice. Medina T. Hi, Andy. When they make an offer, what is the reasonable amount of time to give them my answer back? There's another company I just started interviewing with, and it's my dream company. Okay, a couple things. Let's take the first question in isolation. The longer the interview process, the shorter the amount of time that you give them or they should give you to get back. The shorter the interview process, the longer the amount of time you should ponder. Why? Who's tracking with this concept, right? If I've been interviewing with you for three months and you're going to give me an offer, why do I need more than three minutes to figure out if I want to work there or not, right? We might need to just get to the number, but I could start working the counter offer right now. I don't need like three days. Okay. Now, if I've only been talking with you for three days, I haven't emotionally wrapped my mind around change. Change, even if it's getting off the couch, but changing jobs. I haven't had a chance to fall in love with the idea. I haven't had a chance to let things marinate and think through. So I might need a little longer to think through the offer. So without knowing the duration of your, of your process, it's difficult for me to say what's the appropriate amount of time. Now, I think you asked me the question because of the second thing you asked me, which is how long can I wait before I have to give them an answer when I'm just starting something now. So the minute you started, I would have said to the company who's given you an offer, I, I'm in the process with this company. It's in the early stages. Let me see how long their process takes. I would go back to your dream company and I would say, I really, you're my dream company. I want to work with you and I want to continue to get to know you and figure this out, right? Go through the process with you. But I'm getting an offer. And so I just want to, I want to be respectful to them. And obviously I don't want to miss the opportunity and the event doesn't work out with us. Is there anything you can share with me? Now, because these are so extreme, meaning one's ending and one's just starting, what I think you're going to need to do is you're probably not going to get to go through the entire recruitment process with your dream company unless you continue on after you accept the offer with this other company, assuming you want to accept the offer or would be willing to accept the offer if the dream company didn't come through for you, in which case I probably would try to drag it out a little bit and then drag out the start date. It's not ideal and I don't love doing this, uh, but I also don't want you looking over your shoulder for the next however many years thinking, kicking yourself, oh my goodness, I could have worked for my dream company. So that's because I'm going to cut it there because it because those are extremes. Now, uh, I don't think you're in. the I know you're a leader. Uh, I don't know that you're I don't think you're in the boot camp. It, for those of you that are in the boot camp that in the job search coaching program, there is an entire session dedicated to how to work your interview process, having, you know, coming up with multiple offers, working with multiple companies throughout the interviewing process. And I take you through how to handle multiple job offers, assuming you are going to get multiple job offers. The moment you start the second interview process, assume two, third, three, and so on. So uh, Medina, I, I, I don't think you're in that program. If you are, it's in the, it's in the how to handle multiple job offers uh, session in module five for those that are. And Jalil, uh, for entry-level job, uh, should I even negotiate salary? Yes. I negotiated my salary when I was 22 years old coming into, uh, well, at the time it was Arthur Anderson Consulting changing its name to Anderson Consulting, which has changed its name since to Accenture. Uh, what would be the right answer? I would make I would make an argument based on you being in demand. It's a little different, 
right? So, you know, I would, I would, I would try to talk about my value as much as I can, but it also has to do with uh, the best negotiation leverage an entry level person has is having other job offers. And, you know, hey, uh, you offered me 30,000, 50,000, whatever the going rate is, 80,000 these days. Uh, you know, I, 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 I want to take it. I have these other opportunities that I'm running. It looks like their pay scale is a little higher. But if you can create a package where I can earn 90,000, I'll drop all that other stuff and run and you can have me kind of thing that those are those are tactics i would use on the on the early side of my career all right let me let me do the time check all right listen i have got to get wait care i just uh i i have got to get running folks uh, at the bottom of the hour a couple things really quick uh i hope you enjoyed this if you did uh, please click the like button, send YouTube the good vibes, subscribe to my channel. I always love having you. You know how much it hurts me when you miss my Tuesday morning videos and my Thursday live shows. 